I will now call the June 17, 2013 Blue Springs City Council meeting to order. If you would stand, observe a moment of silence, and then I will lead you in the Pledge of Allegiance. seated. I welcome you to tonight's City Council meeting and also to those that might be watching on cable TV 7. The next item is the consent agenda. Are there items that need to be pulled? If not, I would accept a motion for approval. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Councilman Quibell? Aye. Councilman Fowler? Aye. Councilman Carter? Aye. Councilman Edmondson? Aye. Councilman Culpepper? Aye. Unanimously. Next, we have a public hearing on Adams Dairy Senior Community PUD Concept Plan. Your Honor, I'd like to introduce exhibits on behalf of the city for public hearing PUDC 5-13-3950. Exhibit includes city council information form with attachments, staff report with attachments, affidavit of publication is advertised in Blue Springs Examiner May 25, 2013, application with attachments. 185 foot notification map names addresses of property owners within 185 feet of the site and copy of letters sent to, pro to the property owners. These are all the exhibits I have to offer on behalf of the city. Okay, Mr. Holly, on behalf of the city. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of the council, before you tonight is a request for approval of a PUD concept plan entitled Adams Dairy Senior Community PUD. Many of you will recognize this property. It's located on the west side of. Adams Dairy Parkway, south of our demise, and north and east of Napoleon Drive. This property at one time had a proposal for a mixed use residential, or I'm sorry, mixed use office and commercial development. And at that time, one key thing is that they had requested access to Adams Dairy Parkway. Um, you will see in this development that that request uh, is not being made. They don't need that access. Uh, this particular property is approximately 13.6 acres and the developer is proposing to subdivide the property into four lots. Lot one is located um, just south of our demise. It is the property right here, and the intent for that property is to use it for stormwater detention and open space for the development. Lot two is the primary focus of this particular application. Um, that is the PUD. Um, it's approximately an eight acre site, and they are intending to put the senior housing facility. Um, this facility has 148 units. They'll do it in two phases. The first phase involves, uh, let's see if we have this, 76 units of independent living, independent senior living, and that will go in this area here. And I believe the architect will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, they will also uh, are proposing 32 um, memory units, and those would be located in this area. And then in phase two, um, which they are hoping follows um, fairly quickly after phase one, um, this, this area, depending on the demand for the memory units, may be memory units, and it all may also may be assisted living uh, senior housing. The uh, other two lots are located in this area here. Both are approximately two acres, just a little bit over two acres. And the hope for those is that um, 
they would be used for a medical office, but they would be open based on the zoning for either retail or office type uses. Uh, so that's kind of a, they, they aren't sure how that will go just yet. Staff, uh, the Planning Commission heard this item last week um, and uh, unanimously uh, provided a recommendation for approval. Uh, staff also recommends approval with 14 conditions and those conditions are provided in your um, council information form. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Or are there any questions, Ms. Ali? Any questions from council? If not, thank you. Thank you. Would the applicant like to come forward? Be sworn in. I do. My name is Denise Matheson, and I'm the Director of Operations and Development for O'Reilly Development out of Springfield, Missouri. We're not only the developers, but also the will be the um, owners of the property. We will retain ownership and um, operations of the property. We are proposing a continuum of care community um, for seniors. And as Jim stated, um, there's 148 units. The 76 independent living units are, we call it lodge style um, apartment living, if you will. They are, um, as he showed you that, why? We're gonna say it's a three-story elevator building. This is an, an architectural concept drawing of, of what it would look like. We have lots of reviews that we have to go through before it's finalized, but it gives you an idea um, what that building will look like. And that is um, the first step, independent living. So that is the um, intended for those that are giving up their homes and really just want to live in a maintenance-free environment. But in addition to that, they'll have full amenities. Um, there'll be a commercial kitchen with a private dining area so um, they can get meals if they want. It's not, not required and it's not included in their rent. The units are completely furnished, full kitchens, washer dryers. We have a mix of studios, one bedrooms and two bedroom units. Um, so they can live as independently as they like or they can um, live as involved and catered to as they'd like also. Um, there will be a full service salon there. There's exercise room, um, libraries, there's a theater room. There's den areas. Um, we also always purchase a transportation bus, so there's transportation for those that um, need it to doctor's appointments, to to the Walmart, to wherever they need to go, so they can they can schedule that with the front desk. Um, in addition to that, then the next step, um, like I said, this is a continuum of care community, so it's expected to be their home for life. It's a very difficult decision to make to give up your home and, and go into a different community and develop the new relationships there. So our <coughs> philosophy is, is after they make that first decision that they, and they start um, becoming a part of a new community with their friends and get settled, um, that they can stay there, that it's, it's the last last home that they they have to adjust to now we have different levels so at the independent stage of it again they're very independent they're still active but um, as their health deteriorates there is then the option for the assisted living in the memory care units but you don't have to you lose leave the community, the people that they're used to working with and associating with. Um, a lot of times um, one of the adults is in worse condition or deteriorating condition in the, as opposed to the others so they can stay in the same community. So that is the um, 32 unit memory care is in the first phase. This, it is a single story um, building community and it's kind of a courtyard concept it is a courtyard concept, no kind of, excuse me. Um, and as Jim said, this is the 32 unit memory care side of it. Um, it is completely enclosed and secure for obvious reasons. There's security and wandering issues. So it's completely, the building itself um, circles around a courtyard. And then inside is an open air courtyard. And, it has plants in it, it has sitting areas, sidewalks, it's places for family to come visit and get them outdoors. Um, it's really important that they have the ability to, get, to be outside. Um, in that 
part of the development. We also have a commercial kitchen um, and a dining area there. There's also a private dining when family comes in so that they can um, have time to themselves. There are nurses stations, wellness centers, there's learning stations. Um, one of the things that um, we found with um, the memory challenged residents is just any activity that helps remind them of what they used to do. Um, like a, a, a typewriter, an office station. We, we have that, and it just reminds them of what they used to do. We have um, a daycare or a nursery station, too. Um, they'll sit in the rocker. They'll pl play with the infant. They'll, it just is a reminder that, that triggers um, the nurturing that they've done all of their lives. Uh, outside each one of their <coughs> units, we have what we call as a memory box, and in that we keep pieces that are important to them and triggers of who they were and what their life has been about um, and helps them stay acclimated to the right, um, right area of the facility. Um, our second phase, which as Jim said, we hope will continue directly behind it, is um, very similar. To, it's the same design as the memory care. Um, and it is 40 units, again, with the courtyard. Our hope is that there's, we find that there's a demand for the assisted living. So we will have all phases of the continuum of care um, community. Um, it'll either be memory care or assisted living. The assisted living is different from the memory care because there is not the dementia um, associated at that level. The memory care and assisted living require a certificate of need application with the Department of Health. We have already filed that. Um, we thank the mayor and, and other members of the community for the support letter on that. And we actually go before their board on the 8th, so we will know um, that we have been approved. Let me just be positive about it. That, and that's when we'll have the approval for that. Um, with our final zoning approval on the PUD, the CON application approval, that will be the last of our contingencies. And then we will move forward to purchase the ground in early August. Um, we will start our development and our design stage and hope to start construction the end of the year. Any questions? And I have Tim Wilson with SWD Architects who has done the design, um, worked with us on numerous projects. So if you have any specific questions as to the design. Are there any questions from council? Councilman? Your Honor, if I may. Um, I was uh, there when you presented this to the uh, Planning Commission. Uh, my understanding is there's only one other facility like this in the Kansas City area. Is that correct? That has all three, that's the continuum right. of care. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, my, our operator has done the market study, so I would, I will tell you that we feel our, our concept in our community is unique and they're very, um, they are very limited, especially with the memory care units. So I and, would say that's probably a correct thing. And 55 is the age limit for moving in? Well, it's 55, but it's um, 55 or 62. Okay. But it's a senior, it's age restrictive. I, the average age of our residents is 70 to 74 when they take that first step. Well, my basement flooded over the weekend. I'm five years and three months away from being 55. So I'm just <laughs> trying to plan ahead for the future. Um, but on a serious note, I will say they've already gotten a letter from a constituent whose mom has Alzheimer's and she wants you to break ground tomorrow. Oh, so. <laughs> I have to say we've had um, unconditional support from the staff, from the departments, from the community. I held a um, neighborhood meeting. I had two people there and they were both came to make sure that if anybody was a naysayer, they were there to stand up and vote against that. So, uh, Yes, I just have a quick question about the lot to the north. Um, I saw in the paperwork there was a patio going to be on that. Is that correct? Is that intended to be used as part of your program? We, um, there is a, um, under the Adams Dairy overlay, there is required green space and outdoor space, mm -hmm. as you're all aware of. So we added this lot into this development for two reasons. There's a lot of detention that's going to happen there, and um, the access and the likelihood of ever selling that off is, is very slim to probably not going to happen. So what we did is we created green space, and then we did a connective trail to the existing city walkway trail and that patio we just thought if there's benches or something there that when people are walking they can sit down rest um, especially our residents they, they'll probably use that more than they would the the city long trail All right thank you mm -hmm. any others i have a question uh, on the independent living part of it 
Are, do you have you to have designated areas for them to still have their cars and is that covered or just outside parking? It, it, it is just outside parking. Um, I don't, do we show any covered? We, we do have, we patched in here for carports in okay. these areas here. And with okay. the independent living, we have the primary access from these parking areas here where, okay. where the carports are noted. We always try to um, target the independent living parking with a, a, a second entrance into those wings versus going through um, the main lobby area for just that reason for the ones that have cars. On an average, it's about 50% that come with cars that need the cars. Okay. So that will be kind of private. It'll be designated parking, yes. And then the rest, um, this parking down here, I know it looks like it's far away and it's a lot. And number one, we have parking requirements, but um, it's a back access and it will be used mainly um, for the employees and the service people. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, council? If not, thank you for the presentation. And I think it's something that's much needed in this community. Great, thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to speak in favor of? In the audience, Mr. Sterner. I do. Brian Starner, Blue Springs Economic Development Corporation. Since I first became aware of this project, I've had the opportunity to work with O'Reilly Development. And one of the things that we've done is try, in this specific case, to identify opportunities with the University of Missouri that might provide an overlap and a connection as we've worked on the Missouri Innovation Park. And to roll back uh, the clock a little bit, probably two and a half, three years ago, the University of Missouri identified things related to senior care, senior needs, including working with St. Mary's Medical Center as an area of focus. So about a month ago, I joined with Todd Pelham and uh, the O'Reilly development team and we and uh, their architect and went down to the University of Missouri and Steve Wyatt who we've been working with for quite some time set up a series of meetings and although I can't tell you today what specifically has come out of it I think you all know and I hear about this quite frequently there is a demand for this type of care and facility and I just want to let you know that I think we're off to a really good start with a corporate partner that seems to be bringing something to our community that's not only needed but that could be a fit within the Adams Dairy Parkway corridor and with hopefully not only the community center as you consider that concept but the Missouri Innovation Park. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions Mr. Stern? All right. Thank you for your testimony. Anyone else in the audience like to speak in favor of? In favor of, in opposition to, opposition to, we'll close this public hearing. Would anyone like to introduce it? I'll introduce it, Your Honor. Okay. First reading of Bill Number 4255, an ordinance approving the Adams Dairy Senior Community PUD Concept Plan. Move the bill be approved on its first reading and proceed with the second. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 All the same sign. Second reading of Bill Number 4255, an ordinance approving the Adams Dairy Senior Community PUD Concept Plan. Move the bill be approved on a second reading and assign the appropriate ordinance number. There a second. Second. Discussion. <clears throat> Roll call, please. Councilman Fowler. Aye. Councilman Carter. Aye. Councilman Edmondson. Aye. Councilman Culpepper. Aye. Councilman Quabell. Aye. Carried unanimously. Given ordinance number 4433. Okay. Next, we have a presentation from the Parks Funding Initiative. We have uh, Park Director Dennis Doval, and he'll be joined by Dino McLean, Chairman of the Park Commission, and a number of Park Commissioners sitting in the audience with white shirts on and name tags. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and City Council, uh, for the opportunity to present for consideration a potential dedicated park funding source. As requested by City Council on April 29th and with a resolution on May 6th, the Park Commission has spent the last month reviewing information and meeting with community groups to develop a recommended, uh, to, to, to present the recommended funding this evening. In order to understand how we are, how we are here today, we, we must take a look at what has occurred over the last 15 to 20 years that has led up to today's presentation. Um, out of the blue and into the future was a strategic plan that was developed in 1998, which identified at that time consideration of a sales tax for parks. Also in May of 2006, Renew the Blue, a, a second strategic plan that was implemented by the city, 
addressed four specific areas related to parks, uh, the development of a community center, enhanced cultural activities, expansion of parks, and expansion of senior transportation. Also in 2006, the citizen survey was, was completed, which the community center was identified as a top priority by the citizens. Over the last year, the staff has con conducted park assessments of our park facilities related to deferred maintenance. As of today, we've identified over $15.5 million in deferred maintenance needs within our park system. Um, that doesn't include some specific areas such as ball field lights and a few other facilities, but that's where we're at as far as what we've been able to assess today. Also in November of 2013, we had a joint work session with our park commission and city council. And we'll talk a little bit further about some of the outcomes that came from that here in a minute. But also through this past eight months, we've conducted the community center feasibility study. And again, uh, a resolution was presented on May 6th by city council for the park commission uh, to look at recommending funding on the community center, as well as deferred park maintenance and future park development. As mentioned, the joint work session was held with city council and the park commission last November. The five outcomes resulted from this session uh, led by our third party consultant were distinguished Blue Springs as a leader in parks and recreation, develop public education efforts and community outreach programs, identify and implement uh, funding necessary to achieve identified objectives, continue current partnerships and develop new ones to enhance programs and services, and plan for future to maintain existing facilities and programs, develop new offerings and innovations in the area of parks and recreation. Recently, the 2013 citizen survey results were presented. The results indicated that within parks, uh, the most emphasis should be placed upon maintaining maintenance of parks and walking and biking path expansion and maintenance. As well as support for projects being considered by city council showed that maintenance, um, maintenance funds uh, for existing parks at 70% and resources to support the Missouri Innovation Park at 65% support within the community. With the location of the community center being at the MIP location, it fits into the resources to assist the development taking off. The community center project was not part of the survey uh, due to the feasibility study already being conducted at that time. However, previously, two citizen surveys listed as a top priority by the residents. One funding mechanism for parks being used by communities in this is the statewide parks and stormwater sales tax. In 1998, the Missouri legislature passed a bill allowing communities to enact a vote to vote on a sales tax dedicated to local parks. According to the Missouri Parks and Recreation Association, the statewide studies by other communities have shown up to 60% of the revenue uh, can be collected from sales by non-residents. Also, through a state sales tax, um, funding for parks improvements is not funded entirely by residents through this type of funding mechanism, but by individuals who visit your community. And then currently, 26 of our top 30 communities by population have a dedicated park sales tax. This slide demonstrates those communities as well as park property taxes that some of the communities hold. Um, this, that beyond the previous chart, 75 communities out of the top 100 communities have passed a sales tax for their local parks. These communities uh, exist of a, from residents of 7,700 and greater. Of those 75 communities that have passed a local park sales tax, 74 currently still have that tax in place. Also, of those communities that have a dedicated local park sales tax, 78% of them have a sales tax for perpetuity. However, let's take a closer look at the top 30 communities by population. Specifically, St. Joe, Missouri, the eighth largest city, St. Charles, Missouri, the ninth largest city, Blue Springs, Missouri, the 10th largest city, and Wildwood, Missouri, the 17th largest city. The common thread is these four communities out of the top 30 do not have a dedicated local park sales tax. But two of the communities have dedicated park funding. St. Joseph, Missouri has a dedicated property tax as well as casino revenue, as well as St. Charles has a dedicated property tax for parks and casino revenue as well. 
Blue Springs and Wildwood are the only two communities that in the top 30 of the population without any type of dedicated park funding source. Wildwood, Missouri has only been incorporated as a community since 1995. So the Park Commission over the last month has taken on several action steps in developing the proposal. Um, <clears throat> starting on April 29th, the council requested the commission to provide funding recommendations. Then on May 1st at the Park Commission meeting, uh, the Park Commission reviewed the needs and established a list of community groups to meet with. They also discussed funding options, potential election dates, reviewed park desired standards, reviewed outcomes of the joint work session, and reviewed deferred maintenance needs. Then on May 15th and May 20th, they met individually with community groups, and on May 28th, they held a special meeting to specifically discuss a proposed funding recommendation to present to City Council. The Park Commission met with 10 different community groups that utilized the park system heavily. Each of these groups presented the Commission with their needs and were provided information on the desire to establish a dedicated funding source to address the construction of a community recreation center, deferred park maintenance, and future parkland development. The groups were asked if they would uh, support such an initiative and all indicated they would. All 10 of, of the organizations um, have provided the Commission with letters of support as of today. We've also asked the sports groups to provide us uh, the number of kids uh, that they serve annually, including excluding the girls' softball program, which we um, did not receive their numbers as of today. Utilizing the 2010 U.S. Census information for families, the average family size for Blue Springs is 3.1. When you put the numbers of the number of participants that these uh, organizations have participating in their events, 13,390 individuals are being touched by the groups excluding softball, which translates into about 10,585 residents being touched by the softball groups, or the sports groups, I'm sorry. The Park Commission is made up of nine appointed community members, three from each district. Those members are Richard Meacham, Keith Hanneman, and Jennifer Splitor from District 3. Bill Landrum, Vice Chairman, Jack Gilliland, and Maureen Johnson from District 2, and Dina McLean, Park Commission Chairman, George Debert, and Michael Parker from District 1. I'm now going to have Dina McLean, our Parks uh, Chairman, come up and present the rest of the recommendations. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening. Okay. Soft spoken. As Dennis said, we have had a lot of meetings, and I'm really happy this evening to present our recommendations. The Park Commission is recommending a half cent sales tax with no sunset. That sun sales tax would fund construction of the community center. It will provide money to take care of the maintenance needs, not only today, but the ones from yesterday and the ones for tomorrow, because we have a need there will develop the undeveloped parkland that we currently own and will acquire additional parkland in future years. We're recommending that the ballot issue be placed on the November 5th ballot. Currently there are no competing issues, so we're hoping to get in before anybody else. And if approved, the Park Commission will provide the oversight on how those funds are used. Here's how it breaks down. The recommended funding $2 million annually to pay off the debt of the community center for construction, and that would include a reserve account for operating maintenance. Okay. The park maintenance expansion at $620,000 annually includes money for trails, park improvements, operations, and deferred maintenance and expansion. And we'll go into more detail on these. Senior citizen services at $150,000. Performing and visual arts at 50,000. Scholarship assistance, and that's to help with people that are less fortunate to be able to participate as well, and that's at 30,000 annually. And a sales tax fund balance, another reserve, at 150,000. For a total of estimated three million a year, which is what we estimate the half cent sales tax will provide. Construction estimated for the community center is 35 million. We do include uh, roughly four and a half million on a contingency fund for the construction, and that is a 30-year payback. 
based on 3% interest rate, which is what Christine has provided for us. Timeline, estimated construction timeline for the community center. If approved on the November 5th ballot, January 2014, RFQs for architectural services. April 2014, award the architecture firm contract. December 14, bid construction. February 2015, award the contractor contractor construction, and July 2016 would be the anticipated opening. The Community Center Operating Maintenance Reserve Fund. <clears throat> Initial funding would come from the construction savings if available. That reserve contingency fund, if there's money left from that, we would immediately fund an operating maintenance reserve fund. If not, it would be funded to a maximum <clears throat> excuse me, level of 200,000 annually until it reaches the level that has been identified. And what we're recommending on that is 1.25 million. Once it's reached that, that would not be continued to be funded unless money comes out of it. And then it would be funded again to maintain that reserve amount. Senior services, allocating 150,000 annually to senior services. Potential for that includes improvements to Vesper Hall, enhanced transportation for senior services, additional senior programming, and additional meals. Performing in visual arts, we're recommending an additional 10,000 to the Public Art Commission, $10,000 to the Blue Springs City Theater, and a $30,000 maintenance or grant fund that can be applied for to maintain the art that's currently owned in the city and also to provide uh, opportunities to purchase new art. Scholarship assistance. This is to assist two different categories. Half would go to community center membership where people that do not have the funds to participate otherwise would be able to and the other half would go to parks and recreation programs. And recommending would be evaluated annually to see how that is working and whether the levels are appropriate. Park maintenance and improvements. As Dennis mentioned, we currently have a little over 15 million in deferred maintenance. So our recommendation is that gets on the plan right away. Trail maintenance at 100,000 park operations to offset costs associated with reduced sports league charges, annual unidentified park improvements funded at 100,000, and the deferred maintenance projects currently at 320,000. Future park maintenance and improvements, future park land development, developing future park amenities, priorities for the first five years is the deferred maintenance. And then at that point, evaluating annually to see what can we do from there, because at some point you have to start setting aside money for future park development. Sales tax contingency fund, allocating 5% annually until the fund is built up to 15% of the estimated tax receipts. Again, if there's money left from the contingency fund, this could be funded right away. Otherwise, it would be based on 150,000 until we reach the 450 and maintain that 450 balance. So what we're requesting and recommending to you this evening is that a half cent sales tax dedicated for parks is put before the residents on a November 5th ballot, specifically funding the community center construction, operation and maintenance fund, park maintenance and improvements, senior services, performing arts and public art, scholarship assistance, and a fund reserve balance fund. And I'll stand for questions. Are there any questions from the council? Councilman Carter. Well, it's time for our community to decide what kind of community it wants to be. Very true. Um, and this is a great opportunity for us to do that. Um, through no fault of our Parks Commission, our uh, parks are skating the wrong way. You only skate one way in life. You either skate the right way or the wrong way, and we're skating the wrong way. Um, I support this, but in the beauty of our system is we're going to turn it over to the voters and let them decide what kind of community they want. Um, we're going through the comprehensive plan review right now, and the citizens who've been involved there say they want us to be a top-tier community. But one of the great things about a top-tier community is great parks. 
you know, we just have to find a way to pay for it. And right now, you're in the back of the line on the general fund, and it's like we do what we need, do what we need, do what we need, then what do we want? And we don't have money left over for want. And this gives us an opportunity, you know, for the wants in life. So I congratulate you and the Parks Commission for uh, this wonderful plan, and I urge my colleagues to put it on the ballot and let the voters decide what kind of community they want. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Mr. Johnson? All right, Your, Your Honor, I just want to thank Dina and the members of the Park Commission and the Park staff for their uh, diligent work in responding to the Council's request to bring this forward. And it's a, um, I think it's a tremendous package and it is forward thinking. It addresses day-to-day -day tactical needs, but it also uh, is very strategic in looking forward over the next 30 plus years for our community. Uh, but I think we'd be remiss, I mean, when you look at uh, and not acknowledging the great work of uh, former, you know, Park and Rec Director Roscoe Ryder and other commissioners who have served this community for many years and have put Blue Springs on the map without a dedicated funding source. And to think about the uh, creativity and ingenuity of the staff and all the other people who uh, day in and day out who have... Uh, continued to see their budgets shrink, but the expectations have continuously um, escalated. And when you look at our park systems, and if you think to yourself what's been done in this community over the past 30 to 35 or 40 years in the construction of Hidden Valley Park, in the construction of um, uh, Lake Remembrance, and the development of uh, going after grants, we all know grant funding is shrinking and drying up and that it's becoming increasingly more challenging to, um, to, to get our hands on those funds. We were fortunate to get a grant that helped us uh, deliver a very nice landscaped amenity at Adams Dairy Parkway and I-70. However, with a shrinking operational budget, we have been challenged to maintain and take care of that amenity. We're now putting in beautiful landscaping on Woods Chapel, and it's going to transform that corridor and be, be beautiful but that's going to put a huge impact on our park staff to find funds in their existing operational uh, sources and funding. You're in a little bit, you're gonna hear a presentation about a CIP proposal for the next six years. And uh, for the next six years, that CIP is proposing, I believe it's $150,000 for our park program, and that goes for dredging a lake. Those types of resources or, or allocations toward programming won't move our park program forward. And so I, urge the City Council to allow the voters to take a serious look at this and to, uh, again, appreciate the good work of all the men and women who have brought us this far, who have contributed to the programs that we have today, but now give us the opportunity to make a statement for our future. I'll get off my soapbox, Your Honor. I want to echo the comments that have already been, been made, plus I want to commend the Park Commission for your vetting of this issue in very quick order. We gave that to you April 29th, and here you are back June 17th with a recommendation. So you have to put some extra time in and effort to make that happen. I also commend the citizens of Blue Springs because we've addressed needs that will keep us a top tier city in the state of Missouri, and I would say in the nation. In 2008, we had infrastructure needs, and the citizens spoke with an 84% approval on the sewer system and an 81% approval rate on road improvements. What was it, 2011, we addressed public safety. The voters approved that with a 60% voter approval rate. And I said in my state of the city address two years ago, now it's time to talk about quality of life. And that's what we're doing. We're talking about quality of life and we're giving the citizens the opportunity to do it. Don't let it be said that we're sitting here dictating, no, this is what we're gonna have. What we're doing is giving the citizens an opportunity. And I'm, I'm confident that the citizens of this community want this to be a top tier as indicated with the comprehensive plan that's being studied now and all the citizen surveys that we get uh, is, is very strong and that people want a good quality of life. You wanna be able to see it, sit back and enjoy your community. Uh, and, and I think we're addressing those. So that being said, without objection, unless someone has, has something to say, without objection, 
uh, we would play have uh, staff prepare the necessary documents to bring back. Your Honor, and just uh, to make sure everybody saw it in the packet, we did include a, a sample ordinance of what would be before you on the ballot language, so it is in your packet. Uh, it was made available. It's on our website. And um, we, of course, have a municipal election in April of 2014, so this would, this would be uh, an extraordinary expense that we would fund in the budget. We've already talked internally about how we would uh, come up with the funds to handle that election expense in November, but we are fully prepared to execute and go forward with that if that's the will of the council. And if you, uh, the voters approve, if put it on the ballot, the voters approve it uh, in November, we actually start collecting the funds in April. I've verified that already. So, unless there are other comments without objection, we will uh, have the documents presented at the appropriate time. We actually will bring that forward fairly quickly. Be the, uh, the November election needs to be certified in August. I believe August 19th is the last, or that's the council meeting, um, but we would bring that uh, to you sooner so that we could go ahead and work with the Park Commission and other appropriate entities to begin the processes of, uh, of going forward with an educational and informational uh, package for our citizens. Thank you. All right, thank you. Well, great presentation. So thank you uh, for presenting that, Chairman and Park Director, and thank you, Commissioners, for coming, being a support for that and your hard work. I'm going to give you a round of applause. Okay, next item is a discussion on CDBG 2013-2014 actual annual action plan. Mr. Allen. Thank you, Your Honor, and uh, members of the council. Do you have an opportunity to look at... Uh, grant funds and how to spend them and in fact uh, one of the recommended projects before you this evening is exactly uh, one of those that was already mentioned in the previous uh, agenda item uh, regarding a playground surface specifically for Blue Springs Park so you can see some of the deferred maintenance and such that uh, can be um, addressed through uh, other grant funding opportunities and they're pretty minimal uh, when, it re re when in relation to, excuse me, in relation to uh, parks projects, but uh, Blue Springs Park and Baumgartner Park are two that uh, do have opportunity to utilize um, CDBG funds. So with that, uh, council information form before you uh, this evening lists uh, what uh, staff is uh, presenting as a, what we're calling again our annual action plan draft uh, does need to be published for a 30-day public comment period uh, that would be uh, beginning this um, this is it actually next Monday excuse me I thought it was late yet this week but actually next Monday June 24th and concluding July 24th and come before you at the first City Council meeting in August August 5th uh, approve that annual action plan draft to forward to HUD uh, for their August 15th deadline. So that's kind of the timeline here. Appreciate everyone's uh, patience as we go through the kind of public discussion period here. And this is the next step in that process. Again, this is simply to look at uh, authorizing the publication of the draft annual action plan uh, with these uh, six different projects before you. Uh, the first one on the list here is one I know has been discussed uh, at length in some of the previous meetings, and that's the Downtown Facade Grant Program. Again, that was uh, approved for 100000 in the current fiscal year. And what we're looking at for this next fiscal year, uh, we had originally put in a number of 50000 Now we're looking at only 15000 And we're kind of fashioning this similar to what was done with the Minor Home Repair Program several years ago, where we looked at $125,000 to start. Uh, there wasn't that... Um, I guess uh, amount of funding that was being accessed by applicants, so we kind of scaled back to level it out to about thirty-five to fifty thousand per year. So we started high, then second year we went really low, and tried to level that out kind of in the middle. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. We have the the large project uh, with the 
uh, America's Community Bank on the corner of 11th and Main. And looking at that as, again, it's a, uh, a grant, but it's also essentially a cost-sharing financing tool of $100,000 available this current fiscal year. And looking at just uh, trying to seed that a little bit with 15000 next year, knowing that we do have some of these uh, deferred maintenance projects, as was mentioned in the previous uh, presentation, uh, specifically for Blue Springs Park playground surface. As you recall, one of the first projects that was uh, tackled with CDBG funds back in 2006 was to replace the uh, playground equipment at Blue Springs Park with uh, new, modern, accessible equipment. And that was done uh, with CDBG funds. And so we're looking at uh, simply modifying the playground service to be more, uh, more safe, uh, more accessible. And that is looking at about $100,000 or 47% of the total funding that's being proposed for this next year. Again, the uh, estimated amount is 212000 I noticed some discussion as, it be, as to that being lower because of sequestration. Actually, CDBG fund, CDBG program was, um, had increase in funding for this current uh, federal fiscal year. And as a result, actually, we're, we're seeing pretty much a stable uh, funding amount for this year. So it, it has not gone down as we had originally anticipated. So we're about the same as last year, about $212,000. So with that, you can see the six different programs uh, or items. Uh, these have all been discussed before. Um, again, for a minor home repair program, like I mentioned, about $50,000 each year. That is being uh, accessed and is, is certainly proving a benefit throughout the community. Uh, first time home buyers program is at 36,000. Uh, that's about where we're hitting 12 to 13 applicants per year. Uh, $5,000 to the downtown live uh, group. Uh, they're looking at that as uh, hopefully a, an annual budget so, uh, funding source and then the uh, CBG administration funds. So these are all certainly uh, there's some flexibility within all of these. Obviously, we can look at modifying these uh, tonight if, if desired, uh, but we want to do that, uh, get your final uh, review and direction before we publish the draft with these items next Monday. So with that, I'll uh, stand for any questions. Yes, Your Honor. Um, uh, real quick on a, one topic, uh, uh, the minor home repair program. I think I heard in previous conversations, staff say this year we've opened up the application period to be the full year. Yes. Although it's triggered at you know certain increments within Correct. that year, but still the, you're receiving applications year round. Yes. Yes, Good. we are. Good. I think that's. And, yes, and we've uh, we have gotten a few uh, since again the application deadline typically is the end of January into February, right. and we've gotten a few through the spring here. So they're they're waiting, um, either uh, program applicants fall out. Later on in the year, right. uh, don't take advantage of that, even though they applied for it and were approved, or we just carry them over to the next fiscal year. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we've been getting a um, really positive response on that. Uh, we had if, had a few that uh, were going to court, able to turn it over through the Mine Home Repair Program, and are seeing some uh, some changes to their, their properties in a positive manner. So, actually, we're seeing some uh, repeat applicants sure. because it's only uh, it's capped at $5,000, and they're coming back to uh, finish up kind of the next level of repairs, which has been really uh, a positive for the neighborhoods that they're, they're impacting. I appreciate staff for working with it and working with the Minor Home Repair Program. I know that's a lot of work, and I know that the, the money's in here that it helped fund part of that doesn't, surely doesn't cover all the work that goes into that. So <laughs> Doesn't catch it on it. Yeah, it's, I appreciate that. And again, it's not just community development. We, we kind of the, the frontline staff for that, but the finance department's involved uh, quite a bit as well on the back end, right. a lot of the processing of information as well. The next, I've got a couple uh, pictures sure. that I wanted to show the council uh, relative to CDB funding and everything. Um, and these are not very far away from here. They're in the downtown vicinity. This is a picture of a sidewalk, uh, you know, that's just broken up. Go ahead, next picture. Uh, and that's a picture of it looking kind of at downtown. That's, that's 15th and Main there, uh, looking back to the east. Next slide more of the same busted up sidewalk uh, and another house right there with another busted up sidewalk. Um, the next slide. Here's kind of the road conditions in some of those areas with the asphalt overlay. Next slide. Uh, busted up and knee of an overlay. Next one. 
Uh, this is the needing an overlay, but if you look off to the, it's underneath the shade, uh, slightly off right center, there's, that's the historic preservation that, that you're going into the historic uh, area of Blue Springs. So I think that's all the slides, is that it? Um, yep. The reason I bring that up is I, I'm very happy with the CDBG funds. Over the years, look at what it's done for the public improvements down, downtown with new curbs, uh, new sidewalks, street lights. Uh, things are looking very good as far as public infrastructure and the improvements in the last few years. CDBG funds is really you know, provided by the Housing and Urban Development uh, HUD funding, and it's to, uh, they, they review a community for how much low-income family that you have, and they dedicate, allocate money to that community to be spent to uh, help out in those neighborhoods eliminate blight. And uh, while we've done a good job with downtown, we seem to be ignoring those public safety issues relative to sidewalks and street infrastructure and even stormwater maintenance. Uh, that can be considered public safety as well. Two, two children died in my district in my tenure relative to stormwater improvements. And I think that we should go farther than to take money away from those low-income families, low-income sen senior, senior housing type individuals and giving it to private for-profit businesses downtown. I think that we overstep uh, and cross from, from using the money for public Im improvements and low-income families when we give it to a business, that concerns me, and I think we've gone too far with this facade program. I'd encourage that $15,000 to be go and fix sidewalks or, or do asphalt overlay. I think it would help those residents' property values and public safety more than giving it to a, to a private business downtown. So that's my concern. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Your Honor, Honor if I may, uh, and, and Councilman Fowler, I appreciate your comments and, and some of the sidewalk improvements. If you've all been down Vesper Street, you see one of our latest projects and what it's done. And uh, the dental office down there just finished their landscaping. I think that was last weekend, I believe. Pretty recently. Uh, just real recently. And, and that area is really looking good. Uh, and a lot of the residents are making use of those sidewalks. So I think that's been well spent. Uh, in relationship to the facade program, I just want to point out and remind people that those are matching grants. Yes. That when you throw out fifteen thousand, you're really talking thirty thousand dollars worth of improvements to downtown, and and that has been higher on the uh, on our citizen survey that that we really concentrate on trying to keep downtown and restore downtown and, and bring it back. Um, so a lot of times when we look at some of these monies, we have to realize that those for-profit businesses are putting some of their money back into this thing to try to improve the area, to make it look good. Uh, those areas bring up property value. They raise the ship on everybody as far as their value of their property and what they own. Um, and I know this council did set aside monies for sidewalks. We are trying to deal with the sidewalks in the area. Uh, Councilman Levesey came forward with that and got that going. Um, we do have our road improvement programs and we set aside money for that to improve road pro, uh, improvements and we've, we're ahead of schedule. I believe Chris Sandy will tell you we're still ahead of schedule even though we've tried to carve off a little bit of that money for sidewalks. So we are addressing some of these issues that, that are out there and some of those issues are long standing and we're, we're in the effort to try to, to correct those over the long haul. Um, I think we should still say uh, true to course on these facade programs and make some improvements to downtown to restore the downtown to, to something that we would all be proud of, not only those for-profit businesses, but also for the citizens of Blue Springs as a whole, because they've indicated that they want the downtown to improve. That's, that's my soapbox. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none. Uh, pretty much concludes the, the discussion on it. We do have next a resolution granting approval to publish the draft the 2013-2014 CBD, CDBG action, annual action plan that includes the funding for the different projects that have been identified. That's correct, Your Honor. This resolution would support the funding levels that you have received in your packet tonight. So. Um, it would be in order if there was going to be a change, changing those, there would be a, an amendment that would need to be made. Are there any amendments before we offer it? 
Sure, Your Honor. I'll make a motion to amend to uh, replace the facade money with uh, public infrastructure of sidewalks and street maintenance. There is a motion, you heard it, to replace the funds for the facade program to be diverted to uh, sidewalks. Is there a second? Is there a second? Motion dies for lack of a second. Is there a motion to approve the annual action plan? Your Honor, if I may. Um, I would like to have item number five voted on separately. Um, as a uh, member of the board for Downtown Alive, I think it would be inappropriate for me to vote on that particular line item. Uh, uh, which board? Which board? I'm not exactly sure how to accomplish that because the, the resolution, Mr. McDonald, you have some thoughts on how we want to do this because the resolution just supports the entire action plan and the action plan is being presented in totality. So I, do you have some thoughts on how you would? Well, the re <coughs> resolution could be in a sense split in two and the resolution could be that that be taken out and uh, uh, then somebody, if somebody wanted to pass that, uh, they could make a motion just to pass that, put that in the action plan, and uh, could be voted on by the council with, I assume, uh, Councilman Culpepper is going to abstain because of this. Yes, sir, I think that would be appropriate. Okay. okay, so I'll accept a motion to approve the annual action plan except item five. Is there a motion for that? So moved, Your Honor. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, discussion. All in favor, aye. 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 Poll, same sign. Aye. Okay, so, we have three so now, yeah, so now we need a motion to approve item five on the annual action plan. So moved, Your Honor. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank wow, you, we got through that. <laughs> yeah. And just to keep track, that one passed four to zero. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. show, show council with one absent and one call pepper abstain right okay next we have an introduction reading of bill 4257 approving the park ordinance now for those as a reminder uh, the park commission had brought forth uh, an ordinance that uh, there was concern expressed on two items one by councilman Quibell and one by councilman Edmondson and they have addressed that and come back with a recommendation uh, are those uh, recommendations to your satisfaction? Yes, and I would like to introduce it, Your Honor. Okay. First reading of Bill Number 4256, an ordinance adding a new title, Title Nine Parks, to the Code of Ordinances, City of Blue Springs, Missouri. Move the bill be approved on its first reading and proceed with the second. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. Yes, Your Honor. Councilman Cobell. Uh, Your Honor, I want to uh, talk one more time about the. Uh, section of the ordinance that deals with the carrying of firearms in our parks. Uh, I want to start by thanking the Planning Commission for their very diligent and thorough discussion on that issue. Um, and I wanted to state publicly that while I do not support uh, the section on that, even with the amendment that's been proposed, I did comment publicly to the Planning Commission that I thought that they were presenting a good compromise for the Council to consider. Um, I, my personal opinion, and I have since the last Council meeting spent quite a bit of time talking with constituents on this issue, is that there is no consensus in our community as to what the right solution to this is. Uh, we know that it's not really addressing an existing problem. We know that we are uh, attempting to regulate a lawful activity, thereby potentially making a standard law-abiding citizen not being lawful simply because they choose to carry a firearm in our parks. Um, we don't have a problem with that in our parks, as I understand it. And uh, so, again, I think this is a good compromise in principle, but I'm going to uh, I, I want to hear what the rest of the council has to say about it, frankly, before I decide whether I, I make a motion to amend or whether I just uh, vote no on the ordinance as a whole. I haven't made my mind up about that yet, but um, I think it is 
I think it's a section of this particular ordinance of this particular ordinance that is not really necessary in order to accomplish the goals that we say we're trying to accomplish. The rest of the ordinance I think is excellent. I think the amendments on the other issues that are proposed tonight are excellent. They do very much address it. And again, I just want to thank the plan the Parks Commission for for their diligence on talking about this amongst themselves and for listening to my personal concerns and uh, and with that said, Your Honor, I'll let the mic go. Uh, Councilman Clark. I, too, would like to thank the Parks Commission for taking these three issues back and uh, deliberating them a little bit more. I take an opposite view of Councilman Quibell on the issue, and, and I spent a lot of time talking about it as well because there is no consensus on it. There's really no right or wrong answer. Uh, I talked to um, Mr. McDonald about it, and he pointed out to me that in this building you're not allowed to have a firearm. But as we sit here in a council meeting, we have Chief McCoy, there's an officer in the back, there's a couple of others that come in and out. I feel very safe here. Now, if we're going to put police officers in all of our parks to protect our citizens, I don't think we need uh, to have people carry guns if they have a concealed carry permit. We're not going to do that. And if we're going to abrogate the citizens' right to self-protection, it's incumbent upon us to protect them. And we're basically presenting our parks, if we don't do this, as a soft target. And I'll give you two examples, Aurora, Colorado, and Newtown, Connecticut. Those people went in and did that because they were soft targets. That movie theater in Aurora said no firearms. So the guy knew he could go in there and shoot the place up. Uh, the guy in Connecticut, uh, the schools were no gun zones. He knew he could go in there, kick the door in, and shoot it up and, and get his mission accomplished. I would like the criminal element that comes to Blue Springs, first of all, I hope they don't, but when the criminal element comes to Blue Springs, I want them to have a little doubt in their mind. When they go into a park, I want them to doubt whether, you know, Dina McLean's got a purse. wonder if she's got a little Derringer in there. <laughs> she might. I don't know. <laughs> I want them to have that doubt, so that's why I come down on that side of it. Well, actually, if I understand, if I may, Your Honor, yes. we're on the same side on this, just with slight variation, because if we do not pass this particular provision in the ordinance, we have exactly what you said, which is Missouri citizens having the lawful right to walk in our parks, carry openly or concealed, and therefore, in some cases, there might not be doubt, and in other cases, there would absolutely be doubt. So I would say we agree on, on that point. Uh, where I differentiate the two is whether or not um, we're denying citizens who don't have CCW permits the right to defend themselves if they feel they have a need to. And uh, again, we don't feel we have a need to in this community. The people who felt that this was perfectly okay, a lot of them I talked to, uh, one of the reasons they thought it was okay is because it didn't affect them. They feel safe in our parks. They don't feel the need. But uh, under the Constitution of the United States, we have a right to carry under the under the uh, statutes of the state of Missouri, in an outdoor public setting, we have a right to either carry openly or to get a permit to carry concealed. And uh, we are, I, I had a constituent today say to me that uh, the question we should be asking ourselves, and this is a person who pretty much is in favor of gun control, they said the question we should be asking ourselves is are we trumping state law in an open public large space, we're not talking about a small confined building now, we're talking about large open green spaces in our city where everywhere else in our city, if the citizen wants to, he can carry a pistol on his hip in plain sight, whether he has a permit or not, or he can carry, he or she can carry one concealed if they have an appropriate permit. And the part where I've had difficulty in processing this is we talked about these ordinances giving our police officers a tool uh, to manage problems in our parks. But I don't really think this uh, provision, no matter how we do it, whether we do it the way it was originally presented to us or not, really gives our police department any additional tools because if the citizen is behaving lawfully, as they should, there is no problem. If they're behaving unlawfully, uh, we already have laws in place to deal with those situations. So what we're doing here is regulating a lawful activity and making it unlawful, even though that the citizen involved may not, you know, have any unlawful intent. So that's the reason why I will either vote no on this or, uh, or propose an amendment. Thank you. Any other comments? 
Councilman Fowler? Yeah, Your Honor, let's uh, just, I guess, go to one of our larger parks and do a hypothetical here. So that is Adams Point Golf Course. There's outside, but then there's also a facility there, and it's got right now a sign that says that you can't uh, carry inside of a city-owned building. So which ordinance is going to rule? How, how does that? As you correctly state, we already have an ordinance that requires that you not carry uh, in a city-owned building unless you're a peace officer. And so that remain... That would rule. Uh, so if you, if you didn't pass this ordinance, you could carry outside, but you couldn't take it into the building. If you pass this ordinance the way it's written now, all you could do is carry concealed with a permit outside. outside. And inside, you still wouldn't be allowed inside. Even, though it's, even though it's a inside. parks facility, that first ordinance would carry. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's separately specific to build, city building. Okay. Yeah. Which poses a question for me. What's the enforcement? Uh, basically, the enforcement is you, you're first asked to take your weapon outside. Right. So the only thing you can do is ask me to leave. That's correct. If you see it. That's correct, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any further discussion? I didn't vote on that ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> Your Honor, this is first I've heard Councilman Cobell's concern. I, if you were going to submit a, uh, an amendment, what would it be? What couldn't articulate that? My, my amendment basically would be that uh, this issue is already dealt with adequately in my mind in state and federal law and that we would simply remove that section from the from the ordinance okay uh, would you like to make that into a motion or have you decided well what, what do you want to do if the council would like to at least have the opportunity to vote on it I'd be happy to make it a motion Okay, um, and the motion I, is... I'm not sure I can tell from everybody's to, to, to remove that section from the proposed ordinance. The, the dealing section. with concealed, dealing with firearms. The section is 910.010, if anybody wants to look at it. It, it uh, uh, deals with possession of firearms and projectile shooting devices. It, it, it does preclude shooting in the park. Uh, no first, well, it's got two sections. So, so we'd, have to, we'd have to break that down. Yeah, because not, we, yeah, you I definitely don't want them shooting in the park. Although, unless they're defending themselves, it's unlawful to discharge a firearm within the city exactly. limits. Exactly, that's already on the books, right? Th that is true. Okay. Yeah. So the whole the whole thing, if if if. If you make a motion to remove section 910010, uh, basically uh, it takes us back to where we are before. For existing ordinance that's on the books right now. Right. Your Honor, Councilman if I could take some mystery out of all this, I would support Councilman Quibell's amendment. So is that a second? Yes. Okay. So we have a motion and a second to remove that section from he the He didn't ordinance. make a motion. He was trying to read the tea leaves first. <laughs> okay. Is that a motion or tea leaves? I will make... A motion. <laughs> we'll, we'll let it vote, be voted on, up or down. It. It's fine. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. We, we've had some discussion already, but is there further discussion? Yeah. Councilman Fowler. Could, uh, if we could have our attorney read that B, that what we're talking about, removing there, that, that paragraph? Because I guess my question would be, since it's the section shall not prohibit, just by removing the language, if it doesn't prohibit, we're not doing anything anyway. If the whole section is removed that prohibits uh, possession of firearms and, or sh and shooting firearms in the park, we'll be left with a situation where we already currently have uh, an ordinance that precludes shooting and shooting. City shooting. Limits. But I, I guess I'm saying that about the conceal and carry. It, well, we, we, don't don't be? we don't have anything that makes it illegal to carry a, a, a revolver a pistol or a weapon in the park so we go back to that uh, you still couldn't carry it into Adams Point right that's oh, building the building but 
But this paragraph doesn't say it doesn't take that right away. It says this section shall not prohibit any person in the city from carrying a concealed firearm if the person has a bad, valid conceal and carry endorsement, et cetera. So uh -huh. by not prohibiting it, we're not doing anything, we're not regulating. Well, I think Councilman Quibell is making the distinction that that you can openly carry now. You don't have to have a concealed. Yeah. You, no, you don't have to have a concealed to carry. You can you can walk into a city park. You can walk down right out there in front of the building carrying a, a revolver on your hip as long as it's visible. Right. That's right. Okay. So, but since. Yeah, it just it starts out with this section shall not prohibit anybody from using a concealing carry. I know, but, but we're just going to get rid of the whole thing. But it doesn't say that you, I mean, it doesn't address the other portion of what you just said, one way or the other. That's right. You have to know that it's legal to do that. Okay. So, so, so you divert to back to existing law. laws. Yeah. Right. Just, you divert back to existing laws. divert to existing law, and existing law in Blue Springs is uh, in buildings owned right. by the city or in buildings that have been posted by uh, an owner, you can't carry any weapon. Your Honor, yes. which I might add is consistent with the state statute. Right, yes. The fact that we are able to do that at all is because the state statute gives us the ability to. Yes, and actually because we own the park, we right. could do it there too. Okay. I mean, it's a little different situation, but because okay. of the state law, you have the authority to do that. You don't have to. Okay. Okay, unless there's further discussion, we have a motion and a second to remove that section from the audience, from the ordinance. I'm, I'm saying from the audience, uh, but from the ordinance. <laughs> okay, you ready to vote? Yes, sir. All, all, in, all in amendment. All in amendment. Yes. Yeah. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. That section is removed. Now we'll accept a motion to... Uh, Approve first reading as amended. Yes. First reading as amended. So moved. Uh, well, we already had the motion, right? You've had the first reading, and now you need the motion to, you need to vote. Right. All in favor, aye? Aye. aye. Opposed, same sign. Second reading of bill number 4256 as amended. Uh, an ordinance adding a new title, Title IX Parks, to the Code of Ordinances, City of Blue Springs, Missouri. Move the bill be approved on a second reading and assign the appropriate ordinance number. Is there a second? Second. I doubt if there's discussion, but there is there any. Roll call, please. Councilman, Councilman Carter. Aye. Councilman Edmondson. Aye. Councilman Culpepper. Aye. Councilman Quibell. Aye. Councilman Fowler. Aye. Carried unanimously, given ordinance number 4434. Next, we have a discussion on the fiscal year 2013-2014 to 2018-2019 capital improvement program. Mr. Holly. Thank you. Okay, this really ought to be pretty simple compared to that last item. <laughs> um, again, yes, this is the 2013, 2014, 2018, 2019 Capital Improvements Program. And I don't know how many of you saw the piping out by uh, Greg Grounds Lake, but that's probably the artsiest picture I took for this Capital Improvement Program like to start out by um, thanking the city council members, Councilman Carter and Councilman Levesey, uh, Councilman Culpepper for their participation in the CIP review committee this year. Um, we changed a little bit. In the past, we've had a rating committee where we've asked uh, our members to um, actually go through and rate projects because our capital improvement program is really focused a lot on maintenance um, and there just isn't a lot of leeway. Uh, that seemed like an exercise that wasn't, uh, didn't have a good value return to it um, for the time that was being spent on it. So uh, I, I'm saying that for encouragement next year for the council members that will be on the committee. I, I believe we'll probably have a review committee as well. It's a little less work. Um, uh, Planning Commissioners uh, Trozen and Banks were also uh, on this year's uh, review committee. And 
uh, Parks Commissioner uh, Diebert, who is he still here? He just left. We'd like to thank him as well. Um, the staff involved, obviously, um, thanks to them, and particularly the finance department, who really does does a, a good portion of the work on this particular uh, on the CIP program. It's a budgeting um, device, and and uh, we have a great finance department. Um, I feel pretty fortunate to work with them on this. Uh, CIP is being uh, submitted in accordance with the city's charter. Uh, the 2013-14-18-19 uh, projects and budget are consistent with past CIP budgets um, and the directives provided by the City Council. Uh, no change in our projects. They are again um, grouped into funded and unfunded projects. I think we started this about four years ago uh, and have continued and it seems to be working well uh, as a good way to, to put projects forward. Um, the majority of projects provided this year are maintenance, rehabilitation, or equipment replacement. And I think you'll see that as we go through uh, the 2013-14 budget and projects. The total budget, including the funded and the unfunded projects, um, for the six-year period is $171.2 million. Uh, by comparison, you can see the 2012 and the 2011 um, total budgets. The funded projects for the six-year period is $24.7 million, and it represents approximately 14.4% of the total six-year budget, and that would include both funded and the unfunded. Uh, total cost of the unfunded projects for the six-year period is $146.5 million, um, and the projects proposed to be funded for the 2013-14 budget year um, is approximately $2.7 million, and it represents 11% um, of the total funded projects for the entire six-year CIP. This is a uh, good breakdown, kind of shows you um, how our 2013-2014 CIP budget um, is divided um, and how those funds are utilized. Total number of pot projects that are proposed in the next six years um, for the entire CIP is 90, and 16 of those are proposed to be funded in the six-year CIP. Uh, 74 projects are unfunded. The projects carried forward um, from last year, replacement of the city hall roof, replacement of two HVAC units. Um, we've, we've had uh, some emergency replacement that has gone on with those two HVAC units, um, but they are, in fact, in the 2013-14 budget year. Community Development Block Grant Program is back in the budget. Last year, it was um, those funds were set aside for the facade program. Um, this year, and again, throughout the six-year budget, those funds are back in. Uh, dredging of Lake at Rotary Park, I think um, our city manager mentioned that a bit earlier. Uh, as being the parks project that really uh, very necessary project but in fact doesn't move us forward um, in some ways on, on parks. Uh, equipment replacement is snowplow dump truck, the street difference project. Then we have the Northeast Napoleon Drive, that is the extension of Northeast Napoleon Drive to the east side of Adams Dairy Parkway to service um, the community center um, and the uh, Missouri Innovation Park. Uh, sanitary sewer citywide maintenance, uh, again another piece of equipment with the vacuum truck and then water main maintenance and the water tank maintenance. And this is the Vesper Street sidewalk that I think was, um, was uh, discussed earlier. Um, there has been some landscape additions since this picture was taken, uh, but it did come out well and it is utilized um, fairly heavily, uh, so good project. The proposed projects for the uh, for this six-year CIP, um, all projects that were proposed were unfunded. Um, the comprehensive plan update is um, uh, looking forward. I know we are doing the comprehensive plan update right now, so many of you may wonder, well, how is the comprehensive plan update in there? Well, every five years, um, we uh, the charter says that we are to look at the comprehensive plan for updates, so we are looking at the year 2019-20. Uh, as um, possibly the next time that the comprehensive plan is updated, so that was put in the list of unfunded. 
um, upgrading uh, MS Govern uh, or the GEMS program to the enterprise. Uh, if you have questions about that, um, our, our IT director is here and I think he can talk to you, but it's, it's uh, basically um, updating our, our uh, software that's essential to the accounting, payroll, utility building, and so on. Um, ITO4, the InterGov e-plan review. Um, we've recently uh, moved to uh, enterprise platform with our InterGov tracking system. The e-plan review software is uh, the software that allows us to actually accept plans uh, via the internet and review those plans, transfer information back and forth between a developer or architect and, and city staff. Uh, the retaining wall at the Pink Hill baseball fields. Um, uh, this project is to replace a deteriorating retaining wall. Um, if any of you have been out to Pink Hill, um, uh, near the parks building. I'm sure you've seen that retaining wall and um, certainly is a need. We're replacing a shelter house uh, in Pink Hill Park, number three. Um, I, that's pretty self-explanatory, as are the tennis court repairs. Um, but the, um, the uh, one interesting point of the tennis court repairs is to Young and Baumgartner Parks is that um, that is a project that is being done in cooperation with the school district, and the school district um, has agreed to um, cover 50% of the project costs. The 295 that is shown in our budget is 50%. Um, so the school district then would be adding 295 as well to that to fix those tennis courts. Uh, park trail pavement management. Um, as you know, the Parks Department is responsible for a, a lot of trails um, and pedestrian pavement. Uh, they're, they're, uh, this, this particular project is um, uh, looking at doing some maintenance and providing a maintenance fund and program for the trail and pavement maintenance. Um, the Parks and Open Space Comprehensive Plan uh, is exactly uh, that. It's a preparing a comprehensive plan for the parks and recreation needs uh, within the community. So. This project, I didn't list each one individually, but PR50 through PR66 are all deferred parks maintenance citywide. Um, and, and this comes from the study that, that I think was mentioned earlier. Uh, we've, uh, the Parks Department has, looked, uh, has had a study done that looked at each individual park and the trails and determined what the maintenance, um, deferred maintenance needs were. Uh, within those parks and provided a document that shows those and uh, with that then they developed these projects. Um, the total cost of, of just those projects alone is 11.87 million. That's a sizable amount of, amount of deferred maintenance that, that needs to be done. I uh, wanted to give you a brief update on the Woods Chapel Road project. Obviously, this is not in the CIP um, this year, nor was it last. It was from the bond issue, but um, I thought it would be informative to give a, just a quick update and kind of let you know what the status of that is. So with that, I will turn it over to um, our Public Works Interim Director, Chris Sandy. Good evening. I hope that you've all had the opportunity to take a drive down Woods Chapel Road and see the progress that we're making. Um, everything south of effectively King's Ridge Drive is, is in place. We have a few signal items to work with, a few street lights to put up. Um, things are moving on, moving ahead well. Um, in the coming weeks, probably two to three, you will notice the traffic will shift from the west side of the bridge to the east side of the bridge. That will facilitate the deck to be recoded and the contract or the concrete replaced from Jefferson Street to South Outer Road, building the new lanes and new driving surface. Um, I do encourage anyone watching on TV to take note that this will still be a congested area for about the next six weeks. And if you can find an alternate route to use, possibly using a uh, little blue parkway or seven highway, we would appreciate it just to uh, keep the area a little bit safer. Um, hopefully by September, the entire project will be complete. Um, substantially complete, meaning we'll still have some landscaping to do and some final touches to put on it, but the DDI will be, um, the diverging diamond interchange will be up and running and available for use. And 
the orange barrels will go away, which will make everybody on the west side of town very happy. Well, if I may do a comment real quick, and, and, and I do periodically get over there, and I know staff does that on a regular basis, but it really is starting to look good. I mean, it really is starting to look the The, the fence down along Woods Chapel and the new uh, pillars they put up makes that look like an upscale neighborhood as you're driving through there. If you're not used to being, in other words, if you come from out of town or you're from a different area of town and you drive down Woods Chapel for maybe the first time in a while, it just completely changes the look of that area. Uh, and then with the new development uh, right there at the corner of Valley View, that going up, uh, that whole area, as you say, by the time we get this thing done, it's just gonna completely change the look of that area and, and really looks good. I can't go on about how well it is, but it really does look good. I encourage, and I know you don't wanna do it now, but somewhere along the line, people need to go over there and, and cruise through there and just you know, look at what it's done, what we've changed in this area. Very well stated. Mr. Holly, would you go back one slide? I just want to make a point for everybody watching at home. Um, that's PR 50 to PR 66, almost $12 million. And it's not likely that you're going to find a funding source for that in the CIP, correct? That's correct. Right. Which gets back to the need for a dedicated parks tax and what kind of community we want to be moving forward. And we're going to give the voters an opportunity to make that decision next November. But as you look at this at home, I mean, think about what kinds of parks you want to have. We don't have the money, and we're not likely to have the money in the regular CIP. Right. And again, these are just deferred maintenance. So right. um, that's not moving forward. Quality of life. It's only catching up, so to speak. Councilman Covell. Just one comment on the diverging diamond that I found interesting. I was over in that area the other evening and just by a fluke of the traffic flow, it was at, because the traffic is right now going across the west side of the bridge, you actually could see a little bit of the effect of how traffic was flowing across the bridge and onto westbound I-70 as if the diverging diamond was already active and it was pretty cool. Yeah, it was, the traffic was moving a whole lot better than it normally does. In about two weeks, you'll feel it on the east side of the bridge. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> moving forward, the uh, public hearing notice was published on Saturday, June the 15th. And this item will be brought back to the City Council. Um, contrary to what is noted on the first page of the Council Information Form, um, it will not be July 15th, but rather July 1st. Um, so it will be this, uh, this will be brought for the public hearing and council adoption at the July 1st City Council meeting. And because the 2013-2014 budget is part of this city's annual budget, um, it, uh, it is very helpful if we have any comments um, that the council sees within the capital improvements program. Um, if those would be gotten back to staff, then they can be addressed in the budget process. Yes, right. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank staff for all the work that they put into the CIP and also on Woods Chapel. Woods Chapel is looking very nice, no doubt about it. Um, one of the things that I wanted to kind of highlight was that uh, ST06, the Street Re Rehabilitation Program. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, citizens may notice that, uh, you know, that has been funded now for the last number of years and people are getting new asphalt in front of their houses uh, but there's a there's a big zero in this next coming year and That's correct so next summer there's not going to be that but why don't staff talk about where that money is going to and then you know how that's mm -hmm. all going to play out real quick while we're on Woods Chapel and I got one more thing on that street rehab program so do, do you want to talk about that or would you like me to talk about that sure I'll make it comments very very uh, quick the city had the opportunity to apply for and receive uh, a three million dollar grant uh, through the Mid America Regional Council that would allow for the uh, the expansion and, and continuation of the Woods Chapel corridor improvement um, uh, further south of the current improvement to Walnut. And in order to uh, complete that work, it was necessary that we find matching funds in the budget. And in previous discussions with the city council, the city council agreed to a one year 
uh, deferring of the current um, street and sidewalk program, which is $2.5 million to uh, provide that match for that project. So the, the funds are still going toward infrastructure and roads, but it will, it will always be uh, condensed to one particular project. Right. Okay. okay. And, and the other thing on that STO 6 is that this is a multi-year document and maybe my comments may not be applicable for this year, but in the future years, I hope, hopefully it will show up like that. That is scheduled for $2.3 million from, from now till the year eight, 2018 to 19. That's correct. Okay. And it's a total, and I think, of eleven point some million dollars, eleven point three right. million dollars. Always it started out at $2 million a number of years ago, then it went to 2.3, and it's, it's good to see it keep up with economics. So I'd like to see in the out years that it actually grow proportional to, you know, inflation, I guess because I think we've gotten in trouble when we allow that to stay at a, at a flat line while the cost of living continues to go up and asphalt goes up. So, Councilman Fowler, to respond to that, uh, we do look at that. And in fact, in, in previous years, you may have observed a slight adjustment to that number going up. But one of the things that we desire to do for you and for the, the citizens is to provide you with a balanced budget, one mm -hmm. that can be funded. And so we're very cautious and conservative internally when we're preparing this document is we don't want to show perhaps a $3 million number in 2018, but it, we're not able to fund it. It creates an expectation. Um, it, but of course, that can be funded if you, if you change and you look at other programs or priorities that are in the budget. So we do consider that uh, we take a conservative approach and we want to make certain that what we're proposing to you, at least on the funded side, can in fact be implemented. Any other comments? Point, points well made there. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Uh, you have anything further, Ms. Holland? I do not. Um, thank you. I appreciate okay. your well, time. Mr. Johnson? Yeah, Your Honor, just two, two quick comments. In the proposed uh, funded CIP, 95% of what you are at being asked to consider and adopt goes toward infrastructure. And that infrastructure is streets, street equipment, water, and sewer infrastructure. So it's basic services. And um, I w do want to call attention to the fact that we will be coming back to you either at the July 15th meeting or a following meeting. We are currently working on updating a water and sewer rate study. That work is ongoing now. The finance staff and uh, Chris Sandy and the public work staff are looking at that. And we always put together a three-year proposal on what will happen to our water and sewer rates. As you know, a year ago, almost a year ago, the council gave staff uh, uh, direction and permission to begin working with Tri-County Water Authority on um, an additional water solution for our community and in April voters supported an initiative to move in that direction. We've not yet executed any agreements with Tri-County. Of course the City Council would have to approve those but we thought it would be appropriate to give you an update on that project, the scope of that project, any changes that have occurred with regard to the scope or the budget over the last year and w uh, in conjunction with the water uh, and sewer rate study we're carefully looking at in uh, the impact on those rates as it relates to that project so i just wanted to let you know although it's not called out specifically in here it is a big project it's currently on the unfunded list and there will be more to come at a future uh, either council meeting or work session where we'll talk about thank you okay that concludes the discussion on a CIP. That brings us to mayoral announcements, and I'm going to go straight to Thoughts to Panda. Tonight's comes from Captain Eddie Rickenbacker. And I quote, I can give you a six-word formula for success. Think things through, then follow through. End quote. Don't have any visitor's appearance forms, but we do have an executive session to go into. So we're going to uh, accept a motion to go in executive session, and after that, we will take about two or three minutes to allow our guests to be excused, and then we'll go into executive session. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Councilman Edmondson? Aye. Councilman Culpepper? Aye. Councilman Quibell? Aye. Councilman Fowler? Aye. Councilman Carter? Aye. Carried unanimously.